welcome everyone to this uh, panel about open protocols in the vacation rental industry. Um, let me present you our panelists today. And give me a second because I lost a page. There you are. So we have, uh, in order of appearance on my screen, we have uh, Andrew Jones from UK. I think you said Bristol, right? Yep, that's it. And the Andrew Jones from uh, iPro Software. Uh, very quickly, Andrew, what is iPro Software in two words? Uh, it's a vacation rental uh, management system. Great. So that's okay. four words, but yeah, vac vacation rental software. Great, perfect. Then we have Pierre, Pierre, uh, Sebastian, and Stefano. Your microphones are muted. So, okay. So, Pierre from Smart BNB. Um, from France, I guess, right now? Yeah, from France, in living in Belgium, in a company. Uh, okay, cool. cool. Smart BNB in two words? Um, automate the communication with your guest. Okay. Cool. Perfect. And uh, Sebastien Grosjean from France, but you are in Greece right now. And you have Booking Sync and Smiley, if I'm not wrong. Right. Uh, channel managers and PMS. Can we call them like this? Yeah. That's right, channel manager, PMS, uh, basically central API to manage all your business uh, of vacation rental. And so Booking Sync has grown more and more to an enterprise software solution. And Smiley is our product for the private owners and small entities. So project manager is, um, sorry, property manager and host. Right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Stefano, you're, okay, perfect. Stefano from Italy, Torino. The city of Juventus is going to kill me now. <laughs> uh, Stefan is a professor in uh, information technology. And we've been talking for a while about open protocols and how to, you know, the, the, basically the subject of this conversation. So I'm very curious to uh, hear what, what you, Stefan, have to say, because I know you also went a bit ahead on this, uh, on the theoretic, theoretical part. So welcome. Um, let me present to our listeners and viewers what the hell we're talking about. So everything starts from the fact that um, Web3 is coming. Web3 is the next evolution of the internet. And Web3 is open. It's much more open than Web2, which is the one we're living right now. Um, any software, any web app, any booking platform, as we are trying to do, will need to have open protocols by default. So the question is, okay, how do we build one open protocol so that every single platform of Web3 can communicate directly without needing all these uh, APIs uh, and, uh, and kind of translations between different systems, right? Um, again, for, I know you, you all of course know what protocols are. Let me explain to the viewers what a protocol. A protocol is um, something which works even without any company behind. Let's, let me give you an example. Uh, Zoom is not a protocol. Zoom needs the company Zoom to support our communication. Um, email is a protocol. If tomorrow the world, you know, let's say the world explodes and then there's two survivors and they remember how email works, they can rebuild it from scratch because protocol is just knowing how to do things. Uh, I was writing a message before, like Coca-Cola is, is a closed source drink uh, and tiramisu is an open source cake. So anybody can do tiramisu, can make some a bit different, can make a restaurant specialized, nobody will stop them, nobody will ask them money nobody will send a lawyer it's open source it's something that people know how to do okay so email is open uh is a protocol nobody can stop email internet is a protocol nobody can stop the there's no big red button to close the internet nobody even the you know chinese governments plus american government plus whoever they cannot say we're gonna shut down the internet as long as there's a few people who know how it works they're gonna rebuild it that's what the protocol is it's basically computers talking to each other directly without a third party computer. So uh, the vacation rental industry 
doesn't really work on protocols. The only one um, I would say is a protocol is the iCal, where I can get, and I'm not explaining this to you guys, you know this much better than me. I'm explaining to the people who listen, just to set, set the, the discussion. Um, if I want to connect my calendar between booking and Airbnb, I just get the iCal from Airbnb and import it in booking and vice versa. Uh, without this, before Airbnb came in the market, there was no iCal used in the, in the vacation rental industry. And I had to go through a uh, channel manager um, to do the synchronization. So iCal is maybe the only example. So what we're discussing here, can we build iCal very roughly? iCal for listings so that I can have one listing in one place and then tell to the other OTA, just get the data from, from the first OTA. Um, can, can you get the review I got in Airbnb and import it in booking.com? Okay. And so, and so on. So basically we, with protocols, we will be able to have one central centred on us data set, which just travels around the web and that opens endless possibilities and removes a lot of friction. That's the theory. That's where I'm starting from, but you're the experts. So maybe we start with a question is it even a good idea to talk about protocols or no and let's do like this uh, i got on my screen on the screen andrew pierre sebastian and stefano so we can do with this order and we also see Gianpaolo. Gianpaolo is from host b2b is helping us with the tech um tech service basically helping us to be online today so thank you thank you Gianpaolo. And uh, yeah, let's start with Andrew. So is it worth talking about protocols today? Uh, any cons? So in terms of uh, well, how you've actually described the protocols, I think 100% it is. Um, and I think the protocols have been addressed with everyone creating their own APIs. And anybody who's worked, tried working with APIs can see how everyone does things pretty differently. Um, you know, everyone has got a different format. The problem that we have, even just starting at the listing element, is how people want to display content on their own websites. So how do people differentiate their website compared to a competitor? They'll want to have different um, sets of content, which may not then work with, with another website. Or you'll have a mixture of um, amenities. Some amenities might be, I don't know, like, like a showcase amenity and others will be kind of a, a full list of amenities. So just looking at the listing element in itself, forgetting the reviews, forgetting the guest to try and standardize that people have tried to standardize it with, with APIs, as I say, but it still creates a whole host of um, situations. And then, you know, we, we work with, um, with our competitors as well. We have an open API. And we're always trying to, when we're bringing data in, we have to uh, make, not make up data. You have to kind of map what you're given and then try and uh, convert it into something that works with, uh, with the content that they want to display on their website. So you might only end up with, say, 50% of the content being imported, and then the client has to manually populate the other 50% of the content. So I think... So, sorry to interrupt you, Andrew. So I'm the ignorant in the room, so I'll try to kind of interrupt you guys when you speak to, to keep it... Uh, to understand myself first and then to keep it a bit simpler. Uh, so you say there's going to be not enough uh, fields, basically, because everybody wants different ones. Why can't a protocol have everything and then everybody just chooses what they want? Does well, it make exactly. Sense? That's, yeah, if you uh, can get to that and if you can uh -huh. have a, um, a like a dynamic content section mm. so that there is, um, you know, there's rules in there, then 100% you can get to it. But that is one of the first challenges to come to. And that's why you find that, um, you know, again, going to like the APIs, I mean, you'll have hotels. They, their channel managers scaled much quicker than the vacation rental channel managers because they only focused on availability and rates, which is a consistent, you know, it's either nightly pricing, weekly pricing, and then availability, it's either booked or not booked. So they found it very easy to distribute to thousands and thousands of sites. Vacation rentals, there was a more complex pricing strategy, but the content, so many channel managers don't even try and sync the content and they just say, manually add it to the sites that you want to add it to and then we'll just sync the rates and availability. So that first bit um, actually causes not problems, it's just a challenge and it just has to be planned out um, extremely well so that you can have flexibility um, from day one. So if someone wants 10 boxes of content, 
they can have 10 boxes. If someone wants just one box of content, they can have one box of content. You know, if you look at a website, you'll have a block of text, which gives you the full description, but other people will put like a little promotional box up in the right hand corner. You know, why we chose this property, what our expert of, in the area thinks of this property, why this property is um, perfect for dogs. Um, to be able to design your websites, you need to be able to dissect that content and put it into different places. So could it be, could it be that it's not been done because the effort for a single channel manager is too much, but if this is a global effort of the whole industry, then it becomes worth the hundred percent. So we've started okay. doing something in this line where you have, um, cause we started off standard as, as everyone else, we had a, a summary box and we had a main description box. We then started adding more boxes and then we realized actually we're building it for a case by case basis. Instead we should have, okay, we have one block of content, but this client wants five blocks of content. We can then, they can dynamically add the blocks of content that has a, a separate style. I'll keep it simple, like a separate style against it so that webmasters can then design each of those blocks completely different on the website. So, so that would be yeah, sorry. How we overcome so, the overcome the issue? It, it, to synthesize, it's it's worth trying. It's hard, but it's possible. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Pierre, what did you say? Yeah, I, I was basically imagining what my life would look like if basically there was such a protocol. Uh, it's just a protocol to, to be involved. But the first question I would have uh, is, and I think that's could be close to your heart, but that's really who is going to own that thing? Because you were mentioning the NICAL before, the ICAL is still going to be hosted somewhere. And that, per, that company, that corporation, that person, uh, is in any case uh, going to be having some control over that? Yeah, uh, which doesn't let me answer dismiss, this. which doesn't yeah, dismiss at all the idea of the protocol. Yeah. But there is a reality that is like we mentioned, obviously, open source software, which is definitely make, making my life a lot easier on a daily, on a daily basis. <coughs> the, the thing is uh, that comes with you know a certain baggage of technical knowledge. Uh, and I would be concerned or very dubious of basically expecting that of every vacation rental owner, whatever the segment is like, whatever the size of business is like. And it needs, we are more like in an end user era. That's something that Airbnb completely nailed in their approach to the product, to the design. Uh, I, I think if anything, it needs to be absolutely usable by everybody in the industry. And that's an occasion obviously to make that more accessible than it has ever been not making it less accessible um, on the, on the, and requiring a technical baggage um, that basically would be accessory to actually what is the purpose of the mission, what needs, uh, what needs to be done. I, I, so without even thinking about, you know, a distributed protocol, uh, which is like the ultimate, uh, uh, the ultimate results, I think my life as a, not a PMS, but basically some software that will integrate with, uh, with different channels, we do receive an immense value in simple standardization, which is that you talk to an OTA in particular, that's my main concern, talk to an OTA, you have a certain, a certain list of endpoints, you would have certain requests and responses from the, from the machines that would be kind of similar. The problem that I find, I happen to be less of an engineering person, but more of a product person, my job on a day-to-day -day basis is to find opportunities for differentiation. We operate in a very competitive landscape with obviously Sebastian and I, for example, and Andrew will be talking to different people in the same industry and we want to be different different from each other uh, to get adhesion from, from our customers. The, the problem with standardization and the pressure that it puts is indeed, how can you differentiate in a word by the you get that payload, you get that request, you get that response that was expected of you and you're still gonna, gonna need to do something different because otherwise you end up with five products that don't differentiate from each other because they rely on that set of standards. So obviously I, the idea of Andrew is obviously great is that if you design something, it needs to be designed with flexibility first. And then you kind of, obviously you understand the, the issue here is that immediately when you depart, you depart from that, the, the standards allows to depart from the standard, uh, which means that all of a sudden you need to create a new standard about, oh, you want to depart from the standard. Uh, and to document clearly what's to, what's to be expected by the provider if they want to implement some particular features of that, of that standard data set. 
So that's, that's kind of my, my main concern is you talk about the example of open source, that means about the technical baggage required. Uh, because you are talking like mass, massive knowledge. I can't, fantastic. Web cal, uh, column, slash, slash, a URL. You, you, your browser is going to detect it. Your calendar viewer is going to detect it. Uh, the second thing is really, I don't need a protocol that much. Uh, for me, as a, as a software provider, what I want is standardization. If Airbnb, Homeaway, Booking.com were able to kind of have a set of JSON API, GraphQL APIs, which are words that don't need to be defined, uh, that would obviously make my life easier because I just need to uh, I use the same code to integrate with as many channels as those that are implementing that. Um, the, but the, the thing is, you know, it requires a certain maturity also in the industry. Uh, so there is an industry that works really well on those standards um, on, uh, that has nailed the question of basically who owns that and how does it work between private and public or international bodies, and that's the travel industry. Uh, airlines needs to have, you know, a clear set of bond or a clear set of documented features and standards, you know, from business class, from uh, to uh, hours, etc. And it's it's not something that comes, it's not something that comes from from the actors in the industry. It's something that is the responsibility of an international body that would assign flight numbers, uh, where you have a lot of regulation, we we'll see that is involved in the industry. Vacation rental compared to that is the far west. It's completely new. It's I mean, it existed obviously for centuries. It's basically we're having this conversation fundamentally because of the energy that Airbnb and the capital that energy that that Airbnb has spent uh, in, in that ecosystem. I, I just not sure if I mean that's really I don't have a question on that. But uh, having that level of standardization might come at the cost of more innovation in the ecosystem. And we keep talking about you know there is this book direct movement that Airbnb will be disrupted at one point, just like. Others have been doubt. I personally would doubt that. But the thing is, if you want to standard to standardize too early, you don't really offer uh, that as an opportunity to offer more innovation. In Sorry, the let me explain me that. So, if we standardize too early, it slows down innovation. How how does it happen? <clears throat> I think that if you basically uh, were speaking about, let's say, a listing definition would be defined yeah. by a certain. Yeah, you, you know what, even the reality is that even at the first level, without even talking about what would be the response looking like, um, let's say you, a decade ago, uh, you were talking about XML and, you know, a particular formatted style sheet. Um, it's, I mean, quite frankly, I don't like it. <laughs> I was born after that, after XML was in fashion. I'm, I'm liking a lot more JSON RESTful APIs that are basically using more like JavaScript object definition. Don't need to go into detail. It's just basically a different way of, of, of presenting the data. And now my engineers are far more excited about how GraphQL would work. It's far more open. You decide what you want to have as a return. And this is a technology that also has, be, has time to, to be matured. Even that simple, how do you format it? Uh, do, what is the kind of request and response that you get? You have an opportunity to be completely obsolete. If you decide XML, new, en new engineers that basically graduated from engineering school might be familiar with it, but they don't like it uh, because it has particular constraints. Uh, the JSON API is basically kind of has its advantages, but it's probably not flexible enough and not optimized enough. A GraphQL API might be a better way for the future. And there are basically, we're still at the early stage for developer tools. Um, I'm, not too, I'm, not, I'm less familiar with that. I'm going to recognize that relatively early, but. There, there are still a lot of products that needs to be implemented to basically for that to be so more mainstream. So for example- too, too early means we're gonna get the wrong language or the wrong technology, set of technologies. I think the, the problem of technology is that whatever you do, whatever you st the first step you're gonna do, it's always gonna be wrong 10 years later. Yeah, uh, well, you, again, uh, is, is TCP AP or HTTP the best technology we had to, to do the internet? No, that was probably not the best, but you have, because you have, the protocol won, we have the internet today. So maybe we shouldn't focus on getting the best technology. We're never going to get it and just, and just go, go ahead with it. Is it which which works with TCP IP, um, but you know, you can also have the counter example of the DNS. I mean, you were talking, DNS mm -hmm. is also with your protocol. Um, mm -hmm. And the reality is that the entire story of the DNS is how to, comp it's to nuke it or, dis or basically distribute it. And then you have countries like reowning it or having their own extension and their, uh, and their complete control over the local infrastructure 
uh, with the network. So the reality is that the protocol is not necessarily an answer in itself. It's just a way to exchange data. Uh, it doesn't tell you how the data is formatted. It doesn't tell you who owns that data. Okay. Okay, uh, j just one comment, uh, Pierre, on what you said um, when you asked at the beginning who's going to own the protocol or where it is hosted. I, I cannot answer who owns the protocol because as far as I understand, nobody owns the protocol, but where is it hosted, right? So like iCal is actually hosted somewhere. The iCal, the calendars on your Airbnb listing, the link, the Airbnb link is hosted on Airbnb. Uh, I guess this is fine, but on Web3, it's going to be hosted. It's going to be controlled by the user. So you're going to have, let's say you have an apartment on, on a Web3 platform. You are the person who hosts it. You don't host it on your computer. You host it on, on let's say, the blockchain to keep it simple. Um, so that's, that's a small difference or, or big difference from Web2. But, uh, yep, uh, basically you are... We are moving the hosting from servers to distributed networks. That's one point to, to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just to respond. Sure. That's, that's a perfectly valid point. Uh, the thing, what my concern was specifically about, how do you ensure that it's absolutely accessible and it's actually seen as a net benefit to the end user? And that cannot be just a property manager that has to be a property owner that basically wants to experiment on this one. Otherwise, okay. you end up with more frustration, more friction. That should be obviously the opposite. Okay. There is one. Great point. Good. Sebastian, what do you think? Interesting topic. Uh, <laughs> yes. Thank you already, uh, well, for sure, uh, Luca and Gianpaolo, to, uh, to make this possible. And a uh, great insight already from, uh, from Andrew and Pierre. So I'll try to. Uh, to, uh, to share a bit of my view on that and, uh, and maybe some, some complementary points. Uh, before I dive more into it, uh, I'd like just to take the, let's say some clarity on the ICAL protocol itself uh, and its use case in the vacation rental. It's a bit of a sideway here, but I think it's important to make some clarity. Uh, technically, I think it's a very wrong protocol for what we use it for today on the vacation rental industry. It's, it's an exchange to expose some calendar information. It's not made to do online booking and instant booking. It's actually a terrible way to do that. Uh, there is design flows by design. So I would highly recommend to stay away from Michael for doing a two-way synchronization. That being said, it's a very good protocol, but it has flows for what it's been used for or hacked around for uh, initially by Airbnb and, and that has been used for, for many other uses. Can I so interrupt you on this first introduction? Uh, and that's a question for you guys who you are technical. Isn't it always the case that we always pick the wrong technology, but because it, because it becomes global, it brings more value than if we had waited for the perfect one? It, it, well, it's actually what I, what I said first to, to Pierre. Like, it, it, the best technology never wins. Uh, what wins is the one which is adopted. So, Take, uh, taking action and testing. So the say, ICAL, say again, Andrew. Sorry. Yeah, just you, like you said, you you take action and you um, and you start getting real life testing out there. And if yeah. it, if it sticks, so the ICAL, um, it is a consistent. It's a consistent um, method, and you get consistent data from it. But it doesn't give you the real time information that we need in this industry unless you keep calling it every second um, you're not going to get the the data that you actually need from it plus it's just a feed so it's um but it was it was simple and i think i don't know who first well if you take it for how it was used which is bringing your calendar on your phone from your computer um it worked because it didn't need that instant notification it didn't need that real-time thing so then it had a wide it had wide scale use um and then vacation rental thought oh we can use this and because it was simple and it was cheap it was well it's pretty free i think um that's how they all embraced it and then as soon as the ota started using it as well again it became kind of a mass a mass option for everyone involved um, but it wasn't the it was well it was available so it's not to say it was the wrong thing for the industry it was the right thing because it served a purpose but it's not necessarily the best thing it's always a compromise i guess okay sebastian sorry for interrupting you sure that's fine yeah. so yeah my uh, let's say if i were to bring a which is our view i think i would bring our, our company view on that is Technology is, is just a solution to a problem and that problem keep evolving and so the solution should the same way. 
Uh, and now when we talk about Lycal, it's just a format on how your data is exposed. It's somehow a protocol. Now, the difference is that it is only a part of that protocol. And the challenge that we had with it is that it exposed data. It's not made to inform whenever there is an update. And that's basically what we need. So this one was great for initial start. Then it missed evolution that was standardized. So the standard is still missing. Now, from experience, so on my side, personally, I come from an open source background and I've seen quite a few of these protocols or standards being developed. Uh, there's still way many more people than I am out there that have done that before. But let's say this maybe 20 years of software development and experience with that is realizing that whenever you try to standardize things, and that's where I, I would join to here, and the friction with innovation is just that it takes a lot of time. There is a lot of back and forth to try to standardize things. And the more you want to standardize at the same time, the more time it takes. And then you go into the point that, well, maybe somebody, something less performant will get adopted just because it got better marketed. Because yeah. after all, it's about it. It doesn't mean that it's better or not. It just means that, okay, it got traction sooner. And so I think that's basically what we have seen. I mean, since uh, Booking Scene was started 10 years ago, we were already doing channel management. Uh, to my knowledge, we were on the first one to do it, if not the, the first one. And the whole point has been to bring standardization over this channel management. After all, for me, it's a, it's a waste of energy to feel that even a company has to do that. It's just that, okay, it's because there is a gap into the technology that there is a problem to be solved. But as soon as we can standardize, this doesn't have a place to be and we can focus on other problems that bring better value. So this is a constant evolution. Now, I think we already get way better in, in terms of standardization for exchanging calendar information, rates information. This has been greatly improved. I mean, it was definitely at least to my knowledge, easier on the hotel side, at least as it got that figured out sooner. Uh, we had some challenges over the, the diversity of rate types into the vacation rentals. Uh, I've been very strong advocate on my side, on our side actually for LOS, which is stand for less length of stay, but it's, it's basically a computed cache of all the different pricing possibilities for every length of stay, usually within 30 days. Uh, so as part of that, I'm part of the, of the advisory board member of connectivity for Booking.com. I do the same kind of advisory work also for Home Away, for Airbnb, for Verbo before, uh, uh, for not Verbo, a trip advisor as well. And, and basically this is the same kind of work that what we're discussing here in terms of protocol, but so far it has been tried to do with the people that have the, the somehow the leverage to be able to impose protocols and standards and to discuss with them and explain why a certain way is actually better and most suited for the industry. And from there, we realize that these standards get picked up and, and a lot of new players in the industry don't have to worry about that because all this discussion and work has been done. And I think now we get to an era where the content of the properties is becoming addressed. It's not very smooth yet, but I, I think there is already a, a good part of standardization around content and amenities. I mean, you, you can still go to thousand plus of amenities, but overall most are happy with about hundred of them or, or even a bit less of that. And when you go at addressing a protocol, personally, I will not go at, okay, how we do the maximum at first, but I would go at what is the actual absolute minimum to get it working. So pretty much like in, in agile development, what is the core absolute must that is top challenge today? Let's address that and then iterate on that. Because this kind of small iteration will make you be able first to test the market, see the response, start to get adoption and, and test it. So flexibility, I see it needed. Personally, I'm um, against, I would say, dynamic fields. I think they are extremely painful to map. Um, so, I've been in that path in previous businesses. I moved out of it now because the way we are built as well as Booking Sync is similar. We expose APIs the same way as we expose standards, 
Uh, today we have more than a thousand apps that connect with our API. And if you have this kind of dynamics on top of it, it's extremely hard to maintain and to grow over time. I mean, our APIs, uh, we are now on version four over 10 years. And, and so the maintainability, maintainability is extremely important. I mean, our API v1 is still being used in some cases, it's 10 years old. And so the, the migration path is important. And that's where I think it's very important to standardize blocks by blocks, be very careful about dynamic, but be very cautious and, and keep flexibility. Uh, and that's why even in our system, it's really built in a way, um, I bring this up because I, I basically now get this, this a decade of experience and this still work. That's where I see that it's still good to, to propose is a kind of, of microservices where you have a service that is focused on, on this part and then you standardize and apply this part. And then in isolation, you have a block that stand up on top of it. That can be a new layer of protocol that will just increase the capabilities of what you have done before. And then iterate over time with this, which also means that you can have a core product that you have proven to be stable at some point. And then you can try maybe three different approach on top of that. And then you test them, you see which one works best, and then you nurture the ones that you want to move on with. Um, and so personally, that's how I would, uh, I would like to, to, to collaborate further on this. I mean, technically, that's, that's already what we do internally. Now we do it a lot with our own APIs that we, we also open publicly. Uh, we are starting also to collaborate, or to communicate more at this point is not yet at the collaboration stage uh, with the Open Travel Association, which is also uh, doing a lot of these uh, protocols for the travel industry, which is very light on the vacation rental at this point, uh, but there's definitely work to be done there. And the point is to share this experience that we have had also with the OTAs, with this normalization that is coming up uh, to be able to, to keep improving and moving forward. Uh, but definitely a protocol on Web3, uh, here I see much more advantages because it addresses the protocol part, which is basically how you communicate. It's just a common, a common language. It's just, if some of you speak Italian and English and French, well, we are glad that we have a common language, in this case here that is English, and, and I'm, I'm sure in the attendees or in the, in the viewers, there is more language than natively, but the fact that we can all speak English make us this ability to, to exchange easily. That's what standards and, and protocols are for. Um, now, the fact that we are on Web3, I think the big added value is the, the change of ownership. That even though the data can be potentially own in terms of access rights of who has the ability to, to override it. There is no longer a, a direct owner that can say, well, no, I, I take you out of the database because that database is no longer owned by the single party, say an ODA or, or any, any person like that, which then flip a lot of the paradigms that we have today on, on Web2, where you can end up having your data being owned by a different company uh, I know when I see things like Airbnb that now are pushing to say basically that you cannot ask customers that come through them for their personal data, so you cannot retarget them, or you have no right to even ask a review. I'm not even speaking about reusing their review, they have that forever, but now you cannot even ask your own review for your own self. I mean, for me, this is nuts. Uh, I've, I've directly explained my concern to Airbnb and to bring that back to the leadership, because for me, this is going way too far. And so this is things that come when you have a company that come with strong power and face potential difficulties. Now it's our duty, I think, as uh, people involved in the industry and looking to make something that is parent and sustainable beyond our own businesses, but for the industry as a well. whole. And I think Web3 is a great technology that I'm able to do that. Sebastian, before we pass to Stefano, because now you three are from the industry, from that point of view, Stefano is more on the academic side. Uh, if Web3, let's say, let's suppose Web3 is a, is, a, is a person or a group, Web3 wants to build this protocol, and you're telling me that there's been a lot of work already, and actually this is evolving, uh, where should Web3 go to choose the protocol, or should Web3 start discussing together with the industry or should it just start over again from zero and from scratch and create a, a specific web tree protocol 
uh, what will be your suggestion to, to Web3 developers? Well, personally, I think that's already what you do for uh, a couple of years now, is, is creating uh, communication between uh, technological, technology experts in the industry and try to get the voice of everybody and, and what's actually uh, necessary or seen as desired to evolve. What is the most advanced like protocol right now for listings, for instance? Uh, where is this discussed or where is it deployed? Uh, a lot of the discussion, at least that I see on our side, are still done through closed doors. Uh, closed doors. A lot of the OTAs uh, are under NDA. Now, okay. Booking.com have exposed the API publicly, so that's a great plus. Our Airbnb are still closed. Um, ways they had some part that you could access, but they're kind of closing it. Uh, they, it's, it's a bit challenging. Um, I mean, the, the fact I hear Andrew have an open API. So taking the API of Andrew is certainly an amazing source of knowledge that he has condensed into this API that makes the most sense to them. We do the same on our side with booking thing. I'm sure, Pierre, do you have an open API as well on your side? Yeah, we do very basic for now to be to be honest but that's basically you can do all channel management operations already yeah okay so, so yeah. looking at open APIs that, that okay. will be the first okay. thing Look, looking at companies that already have a strong footprint strong connectivity okay. and have tried to already do this work and kind of do this work on top again and and speak with them i mean in in many cases we are open for discussion and we are all looking for doing this i mean that's that's also why we are on the call today yeah. we, we do have busy schedule so if we take time off it's because we want to keep adding value and, and see this coming up okay um so yeah that's amazing. that's how i would recommend to approach it amazing um stefano so with stefano we had a few discussions in the last weeks uh, and stefano was kind of proposing some kind of approach and and then we stopped when i said look i'm not technical enough <laughs> to to go ahead with this Let's first talk to the experts, like in this case, you guys. But then Stefano didn't stop. He went ahead with a, with a friend who is much more technical than, than us. And uh, so one question is, what's the situation, Stefano? And in general, what do you think about the discussion um, we had so far? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. You, you probably see me waving continuously while you were talking because most of the things I, I have been uh, hearing are, are, are very, I can, I can um, subscribe completely. Um, I, I took some notes actually, so I would like to try and, and, and go, <laughs> and go by step by step, uh, starting from, from Luca's uh, introduction about Web 3.0. Uh, to, my, to my eyes, uh, I, uh, you, you say that I am the academic, I'm not, uh, but, uh, but yes, one thing that I am for sure is, is, uh, is one of, uh, of, uh, of the old uh, uh, cyberspace citizens, because I was there, like you, Luca, since 1991, too. When I'm 25, I wasn't born. Yeah. <laughs> 92, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I remember pretty well Web 1.0 and the, trans uh, the transition between 1 and 2, uh, so to my eyes, what happened is, is something that happens very often in, in the IT field, that uh, uh, we have waves uh, of, of fashion, you know, uh, and like, uh, like uh, Jeff Hota used to say, if you stay around long enough, you'll become fashionable again. So <laughs> what is happening now is we, we, before the internet, we had a broadcast communication. There were a few guys speaking and all the rest of the people listening to those, to those guys. Then we had Web 1.0, which was difficult to use was for techies, but was multicast. It was actually was, was real multicast stuff. So everybody had its, its own voice. Uh, just to, to give you an idea, the first idea that comes to my mind is in the media, okay? People from, from the street uh, talking at the same level of loudness of the Italian television back 2001, okay? So that was multicast. Mm -hmm. uh, and then now we, 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 we went back to broadcast again in the, in the field that we are looking at now, but this is pretty uh, a, a tendency in all the web 2.0. That is, uh, we created places like Google for search 
like Airbnb and Booking for uh, the vacation rental where everybody goes and then those guys who distribute the menu in the middle of the problem, okay? Uh, but this is not, I mean, this is something old, okay? We, we, we came back to something old. And so I think that now is, we, we're just spinning around. No, we, we are on the second uh, uh, turn in this, in this uh, spiral. Uh, so to me, it looks, uh, the problem with it we, we, we're facing today, it looks like uh, uh, a, problem, a problem that is known in literature. Okay, the academics would say the problem is known in literature. Uh, like, for instance, uh, uh, who owns the protocol? Well, in, it, to me, the, 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 the first reply that comes to my mind is, that, is the World Wide Web Consortium. No, it's like for XML. Who owns XML? Who owns HTML? There is the, the, the World Wide Web Consortium, which is a place like the place in which we are now, a place in which reasonable people use the scientific method to compare ideas and come up with the, not the best, but the less worse, <laughs> the most, and, and, this, and this replies to the other um, observation, you know, which, which idea wins? Is it the best idea that wins? Uh, probably not. The best idea, I mean, the, the idea that, that wins is the one that, the, the one that adapts faster, you know, like Darwin's, uh, Darwin's statement, you know, is the one that fits uh, better in the shortest time available, okay, so that, that it can reach uh, sufficient momentum within the, the community of experts to emerge from all the other options that we have. Uh, so, um, Again, so we, we could, to solve this problem, we could, I think we should look at the past. That is, how was the internet uh, built? I mean, how were the protocols of the internet built? Uh, I think we should, uh, we could move that way. In particular, uh, the, 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 technical, uh, the technical suggestion that I received is uh, uh, look at RSS the really simple syndication. Uh, I, uh, I assume that everybody had used that before, before Facebook became so, uh, so famous. I mean, there were uh, once in a time that now lives uh, uh, a long time ago, uh, we didn't have Facebook and people who, who wanted to, be in, uh, to get information from the internet used to use uh, uh, RSS uh, uh, feed readers. There were programs that were capable of, of getting the information from blogs and news sites to build their own newspaper, okay? So the, the idea behind uh, how we could move for a vacation rental simple syndication, like I, I used to call in our discussion with Luca, is, uh, is like that. I mean, to build something that looks, that looks I mean, that mimics the, the behavior of the good old RSS, uh, which uh, to reply that this was the reason why my waves were stronger when Sebastian spoke, because it, it, it also, it goes in the direction of, of closing the gap with ICAL, because ICAL exactly was, was, was not meant for that, was meant for exposing information and not for being updated. Why RSS was explicitly built in that, in that, with that idea in mind, that the, the news sites and the blogs and everything were pushing information towards the final user. So each uh, time- Stefano, who killed RSS? I, I know it's not dead, but you know, no, who killed it's it? No, it's disputable, it's mm disputable -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty much um, kicking it to be dead. I mean, uh, it's not, uh, what I would say is, is not that it's, uh, uh, it's not famous as it used to be 10 years ago, because most of the people, uh, and here we, we very good, good, very good question because we're touching another, another big issue here. Uh, people, I mean, we have, we, have, uh, we have two issues. We have two needs uh, in this quest. One is the need for uh, simplicity of convenience, uh, and the other one is the need for freedom. These two needs in my eyes are a little bit conflicting. 
uh, that's the reason why you spoke about open source. I like to put the uh, accent on free, okay? So for me, the point is free protocols for the free web 3.0. Because uh, what, we, what happened is that we had a solution that was uh, not bad, uh, that, that had all the advantages of freedom because there was no owner of the blogosphere, okay? There was no big, uh, just one site where all the people went for getting news. Everybody was able to build its own, uh, its own feed, but it was more complicated to use than its Facebook. So when Facebook came, uh, the, the convenience won greatly over the, uh, over, over the freedom. And that's pretty much what happened with, with Airbnb and Booking. Think about, uh, think about what most, I mean, if you speak with, with hotel owners, uh, frankly, uh, when, when you speak to them about the, the advent of Booking, most of them tell you, uh, I mean, in the beginning, it was easy. So it, it took away some work that we didn't, didn't want to do, like looking for the client uh, looking for creating a web uh, image of my auto. There was booking doing that for me. I could sit on my, on my desk and wait for clients to come. So they, they valued that over the problems that were, I mean, not all of them were unaware of the problem. That's what I mean. Most of them sense that this would uh, lead to this to the present situation but they say to themselves well for the time being this solves my problem so let's go on okay so we have a great opportunity here i think uh, for, with web 3.0 we have a fantastic opportunity which is we we saw how the world was uh, with freedom and complicated stuff then we saw the world with without freedom and with very easy to use devices. Now we can sit and think uh, of a third attempt to build something that has a balance between usability and freedom. So it's up to us. Hmm? And, uh, and about the way to proceed is the scientific myth. Okay, reasonable people speaking on uh, knowledgeable about the, the thing that we're talking about, speaking together to get the best possible uh, solution. That's so my... it, it's, it's interesting what you say, Stefano. It's like, let's go back to web one to get back the decentralization and uh, let's forget, let's try to go away from the centralized web two where the only ones are really happy tend to be the big corporations or the startups who get a lot of money, but that's just a, a party which doesn't last forever. So uh, go back to web one with new technologies. And, and, and I would add that the difference between web three and web one is that web three has a protocol for trust. So the, all the issues you had in web one can be solved by the fact that now there's a, uh, kind of a cryptocurrency and immutability aspect of it. Basically, you can trust applications of web one as you could not trust them before, but that, that's a bit maybe uh, too, too difficult to explain without examples and without taking too long. But you, you're saying, let's go back to web one in a way. Uh, we can do actually, it better than before. Mm. Actually, everything is still there. I mean, this, this yeah. whole web two construction is it's just an is, yeah, it's just an illusion. I mean, if you scratch, if you scratch the, um, I don't know, the, the word. The the surface. Name, yeah, if you just scratch the surface and everything is there, I mean, it's, it's perfectly working. And this replies to your, to your question about is RSS dead? No, it's simply there. It's, not that. it's just covered it's, by other things. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just covered. slipping, yeah. it's just slipping yeah. and, and it could come back. Like email, email is always, email is gonna die and it never dies. But we <laughs> yeah, communicate with, with uh, Eastern messages on WhatsApp, Instagram, etc. But email is still there. So the let's go back to email, but let's make e email better in a way, right? Yeah. Okay. It, it dates back 1965, eh? just to give yeah. an idea. Yeah, That's yeah. So before, it's before us. So it's something. Yeah. And it doesn't die because it's decentralized. So, yeah. Uh, okay, guys, we don't have much time. I would like to have uh, one, each one of you to, to say a, a last thing. So, 
my question is, but you can say other things if you have something more pressing. My question will be, what will be the next step? And will we wait for things just, just to happen? As Sebastian was saying, like things are actually moving. Shall we just wait? Or is there a next step you would suggest? That's my question. But if you have other things you want to talk about, go ahead. So, Andrew, start from you. Okay, thank you for that, Luca. Uh, yeah, I did want to just go back over something because I think we dived into, um, you know, how it all happens, how it's all going to work. Um, and there's kind of a, there's a reason why we're looking at this. And we've touched on it through the conversations, but not in, in huge amounts of detail, was, was the ownership of the data. So you've got the guest, the guest data. And I know we had a conversation about this. As a, you have your own kind of protocol passport, which contains all your data. And you can decide how much of that data you pass on to the company that you book with. And then with the list in itself, um, because we obviously, you know, well, Sebastian is different because he works with owners. I'm not sure smart BNB, you might work with owners as well, actually. So whereas we only work with agencies, um, you have, sorry, just, <laughs> we have, um, uh, what was I going to say? So we have, yeah, in terms of the, the, the ownership of the property. So when, when you have a property, the, the owner lists the property with your protocol, for example, they can then list that property with an agency or they can manage the listing themselves across various OTAs that, that pull that property in. And then they fall out with one of those companies and they want to take all of that content back off that um, website. They, with, this, with this platform, they could do that. Uh, if they worked with one of our clients, for example, they'd say, okay, I don't want to list with that company anymore. Yes, you have all my property data at the moment. You might know who my housekeeper is, who the, um, you know, the direct contact is there. By me pressing a button, I take ownership of that content back. You might, your, it won't affect your booking data, and that would have to be some kind of control their side. But it just, it's about controlling the data. Who, own, who truly owns that data? And anybody who's marketing the property, um, they don't own that data. They only own the commercial aspect of it and not the actual original source of the data. And I think that's the whole point of exploring this and trying and that would be the reason why you would go to a standard uh, a standardization on the protocol so that you might lose some functionality to begin with but as it evolves you can bring that functionality back in yeah uh, that's actually uh, thank you very much Andrew. that's exactly <laughs> something i wanted to follow up on and thank you very much sebastian stefano i learned actually a lot uh, on, the, on that on that workshop it, it's actually i think there are kind of three levels uh, if you want to, to in, in that conversation, you have the standardization, which probably would have the most value for the ecosystem, for the OTAs, for the, for the channel managers, for the, for the property management software. It probably not directly on the, on the end user, on the, on the, on the individual host, it's simply reducing the engineering time, uh, making sure that it's more maintainable all over time. And there has been plenty of conversation in the industry about that. I remember attending a panel. Uh, last year at the VRMA when in New Orleans, when actually physical events were still in fashion. Uh, and it was a meeting with Steve Milo uh, with basically a list of feature requests of what an enterprise PMA should be looking like. Uh, there were also, there, not even, there are also a, a panel on, uh, which maybe Sebastian is familiar with, definitely more than me, uh, about basically what is the kind of standardization of an API, uh, and including even on the commercial practices. I've learned that actually some APIs charge for access or have some revenue share arrangements, which basically are for me completely antithetical to the idea of having an API to have machines communicating with each other. But th th that's tonalization is kind of the, the kind of uh, foundation for what's coming next. Uh, then you have portability, and that's exactly what Andrew was talking about, I think, uh, which is that when you have a phone number, you can change your provider without having to change a phone number. And that's actually because in the 90s, people realized that if you want to have a competitive landscape in the telecom industry, that's never going to happen if every time you need to be changing your phone number and contacting, etc. You don't need to own that. You never needed to own that. You, you can simply have your Airbnb listings, picture, et cetera, definition in some particular format in JSON, and you basically import it directly to I'm away or to booking.com, you actually do have a significant advantage because you are going to be having a head start, but there is no question about the portability. There is no question, sorry, about the ownership. Where ownership is really valuable, it's actually not very, I mean, there is obviously some philosophical um, and economic conversation that can be had about this. But in the web too, the idea of basically having the centralization of data across a few companies, basically big data, you can analyze, you can personalize, uh, you can make more bang for your buck on the data that you are able to generate. 
I think that's something that was discussed also in the previous workshop, but basically the problem that if you want to build a work or cooking platform in the future, one of the problems that you have to face is that for an individual user, there is too much inventory and you need to be able to personalize the results to make the experience actually be a lot faster. My, my first idea in this industry was actually not related at all with the meeting messages, right? Basically scoring the top five listings that are relevant to you. Um, didn't work, no business model whatsoever for this one. Uh, but th that's, that, that the ownership is probably, there is a physical, physical consideration, yeah, not. But the idea is that fundamentally it needs to serve the end user. So a technology needs, it doesn't need to be great. It just needs to have to be massively adopted. That's how you design what is the best technology. It, that basically it won. Uh, and the second part is that basically there needs to be some kind of advantage uh, it's a kind of advantage for the for the kind of end user as a traveler, the guest, uh, the guest side of things. That's where the money is coming from. Uh, if you basically end up with a lot of risk, I mean, that, and that's about the exploitation for the commercial aspect of that data without having necessarily to own it. So it's basically kind of sharing agreements more than uh, or leasing agreements on the on the data that you that you had initially. But yeah, I, I was thinking, especially after after the speech from Stefano. Maybe the, the curse of Web3 is that there was Web2 first, and we are trained now on, on basically the convenience and the simplicity of UIs that have been engineered to make us completely abandon control uh, in a, an active or subjective way. Example in case TikTok. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> just to add on this, uh, Web3 is promising in the sense that right now it's working very, you know, there's a lot of movement in the, the cent in the, decentralized finance and if you dig into this it's called DeFi. uh there's a few new apps which are really really simple to use so uh, i'm positive i'm um, optimistic that web3 you know web1 didn't have this problem you know the internet whatever you know whatever website is the internet is we went from books to websites so anything worked today you cannot do something new and go back 20 years in UX, you have to do something usable. So I'm sure it's gonna be addressed. The problem is today on Web3, blockchain is mostly done by engineers and engineers are not UX experts. So the next wave, and they're starting now, there's UX web, UX web experts coming in and making things easier. Uh, they are, you know, uh, they say that the guys with a, uh, with a violet hair, the designers, they're coming now. Right, so it's going to the right direction. Uh, Sebastian? Yep. Uh, very interesting point, the point of uh, interface and design. Um, I think there's one thing to keep in mind as well is the evolution of technology. Uh, and now we're reaching a point of convergence through a couple of technologies that we're gonna see coming in the next five to 10 years. Uh, and I speak mainly about three of them, I think, for our industry that's going to be changing the landscape in ways that it's hardly predictable today, which is 5G, AI, and virtual augmented reality. And interface that we know it today are going to be gone entirely. Uh, a search page like you have on Booking or Airbnb or Verbo just won't have any sense a couple years from now because your AI is going to pick your next property and you're going to potentially not even go there because you might just be in VR. Or there is just so much options that are coming out. And in terms of UI design, when we are looking at, at building protocols on new standards and new decentralization uh, types like Web3, uh, I think by the time this gets to production, um, I mean, th there is already a consideration that has to be taken toward this evolution of technology as well. Um, so that's, that's what I think is important to keep in mind there. Now to get back to your initial question around next steps. Mm, well, I think someone that want to start something on Web3, I mean, you already have some initiative going on on your side, Luca. So that's, that's great to see. I think this just needs more traction. At the end of the day, I think we are still today in an industry of offer and demand. If you can bring either large demand to bring the offer or large offer to qualify a demand and that connection is reliable and easy, so that's where we go as interface and still need some easy interface. Well, that's enough to get started. And so the next step doesn't have to be something complicated. 
to do a minimalistic website that is enabling you to do instant booking, because I think in the vacation rental industry, that's now been a standard. You need some rental information, some availability, some pricing, and the ability to basically live check or live book a property. So you prevent double booking. That's maybe one thing that is too often undervalued, but if you are able to get this built in and to bring the security of no double booking, then you have something solid. And for that, the level of information and standardization is already very, very strong. And I think looking at, at, a, at a couple uh, main actors in the vacation in rental industry, we, we already see here today, um, I think you will see that there is a lot of overlaps within our apps, within our APIs. We are all used to do this kind of mappings. Uh, it's possible to connect to our apps. Uh, so as a next step to somebody that wants to do that, I would say start to create your own channel by, by connecting to already standards that exist, potentially create small standards with a minimum needed to get you started and then just grow from there. Thank um, you, Sebastian. Okay. Sure. So we end up with Stefano. We are already over time. So yeah. Keep it short. Yeah, yeah no, Thank super you. short, super short about the ownership of data in this, in this quest that we are discussing today. Uh, we can think, uh, we can take into account the fact that the, uh, the last moves of the European Union all uh, are going in the direction of giving the control over data to people, not to companies. Okay, so the, the way the GDPR was conceived and all the, I mean, then there's a lot of discussion. <laughs> I mean, we could go, we could, we could have another 10 panels just about that. But I mean, the, the, my observation is uh, there is a positive push in the European Union towards giving back the control over data to people. And these kind of technology will do that. Uh, I mean, I didn't say that in the beginning because uh, I, 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 it seems uh, uh, automatic for me, but my opinion is that this information, the information about the listing should be owned by the, the property manager or owner. I mean, the, the, single, uh, the, the single owner. And it could be hosted where, where they want. I mean, from what, what price to uh, the, the, the blockchain, whatever, it doesn't matter. The point is the license. The point is the license. The license should, should allow the use of data by booking Airbnb, etc. but keeping it clear that the ownership, the owner of the data is the one that owns the place, the house, the whatever. Or the owner of the data is the one who created the data. So if I'm the one, well, that's how the web tree works. If I create some data, it's connected to my public address, my account basically, and I have the private keys, basically the password to change it or to, to do modifications. So the rule is the one who creates the data is the owner of the data, which is very close to what you say, basically. Yes, yes. Yeah. This could, could, I mean, we, we could discuss this because uh, a technical people in, the, in between could own the data then. I mean, like, I could be the owner of the data of 10 people that uh, are uh, giving me uh, the data about their, their houses, you know? And I don't think, it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure this could, could work. But anyway, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, yeah. fine tuning. This is fine tuning, let's say. But the point is, <laughs> yeah. Maybe a little note on that, on that note, Stefano. Um, I think it's important with GDPR to keep in mind that there is also the, the right to have your data removed from everybody that have accessed it. And that's one of the challenge of the blockchain, especially when you go with immutability, is that the data is there and it doesn't move, it doesn't change. And so that's one of the big strengths, but that's also one of the biggest problems in terms of privacy policy, in terms of GDPR and, and, and actually how to remain compliant with European regulations for European citizens, which blockchain still have some, I mean, it depends which blockchain, but immutability still brings some challenges with this too. Um, that is also some of the challenges that are to be addressed with Web3. Okay, good. All right, thank you guys, that was amazing. Uh, we would need 10 panels a week like this to, to really go deep into that, but I think it was a very good introduction to the problem. 
Um, so this video is going to be online in a few days. I'm going to, I'm sure, rewatch it for a few, a few times because it was very densely packed with uh, ideas and, uh, and hints on how to move forward. Um, I'm just going to invite you to the next one, which is on Monday, and it's incredibly interesting. There's another French guy. Uh, this is Clément from Cleo, Cleros.io, which is basically how we're going to manage disputes, like, you know, when the gas breaks something, how can we take a decision on, you know, where the money goes without having a company behind it? And you'd be surprised if you don't follow this space. There's actually a decentralized solution. Cleros is the most advanced I know so far. So we're going to listen to what he has to say. And we're going to have uh, Marco Crotta, an Italian expert in blockchain, more on the Bitcoin, uh, maybe maximalist side, maybe not, but he's, he's also expert in Ethereum. And we're going to discuss basically how to replace Airbnb's resolution center without giving this power to another company, but with distributing this power to the network, the people who use it. So that's the next panel. Um, thank you very much, guys. It was amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank thank you. you Bye, everyone. For your Ciao. Ciao. Thank you Ciao. for uh, attending and doing. Okay. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.